Welcome to International Hawaii on Think Tech, where we showcase local import and export companies and the trade industry. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, and today we're chatting with Ernie Lee of First Vitals Health and Wellness, an awesome company and an FTZ9 tenant. Yay! Hi, Ernie. Thank you so much for joining me. Aloha, Cindy. Thank you for having me and welcome. <laughs> Good. So, First Vitals, I know I've run into your team across the hall, but can you briefly explain what your company is and how you got started? Sure. Well, First Vitals is a healthcare service provider that what we do, we provide support to primary care practices here in the state of Hawaii. So our staff consists primarily of nurse practitioners, certified case managers, pharmacists, and care coordinators. So we started back in 2012 with a federal grant from CMS, which is the uh, Centers for Medicaid Medicare Services. And we were charged to provide remote patient monitoring you know, for high-risk diabetic patients here in the mm. state under the Medicaid Quest program. Mm. So when we got established here at the trade zone, you know, we were importing Bluetooth-enabled glucose meters as part of a remote patient monitoring program. So having done that, we're being able to, you know, interact with the federally qualified health center, you know, deploying these glucose meters to this high-risk population and be able to connect to a smartphone or a tablet and be able to obtain their glucose readings on a real-time basis and provide that information to their healthcare provider. And then they're able to intervene at the most appropriate time. So that lasted from 2012 to 2015. Then mm -hmm. after that, we commercial, commercialized our operations and we became certified credentialed with the insurance plans like HMSA and UHA. And the remote patient monitoring platform is continuing on you know, serving you know, the high-risk population and with the pandemic, it becomes to be very useful to be mm. black people, you know, remotely. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And the timing was great that you guys are doing that. Yeah, it was. Mm. I'm glad that's still going. Um, and so what I really wanted to cover now that we know that why you're in the foreign trade zone, you have a new project that's really relevant to Hawaii and the pandemic recovery. And it's regarding testing for antibodies produced by the vaccine for COVID-19. So how did you kind of get into that? And can you briefly explain this service? Sure. Well, originally we were tasked by uh, the state of Hawaii, as you know, under the Safe Travels program. Mm -hmm. You know, they were looking at how to verify CDC records. So one of the tasks that were given to first virus was to look at you know, how can we verify these CDC vaccination cards? Mm. So during this exploratory and discovery phase with the state, you know, our clinical team asked the main question as well, it's great to be able to verify vaccination cards, but what we really need to know is, you know, how long would an individual be protected, you know, from COVID if they've been vaccinated? So that set us off in moving in the next direction, you know, after verifying a vaccination card, you know, how long would that person be truly be protected based on their vaccination. Mm -hmm. So we know that we don't know how long the immunity will last from the vaccine, but we also know from the CDC is providing guidance that's going to be forthcoming in the next few weeks, looking at you know, the people who are immunocompromised or elderly or even healthcare workers that mm -hmm. were vaccinated in the early days back in January, February or so, they're going to be coming up, you know, for consideration if there's going to be a need for a, a vaccine booster. Mm -hmm. So in able to determine that, we need to kind of look at, you know, what are their antibodies level, you know, that has passed since the time they received their second dose of their vaccine. So then the high risk individuals will be able to be prioritized in for their, you know, booster shots. So we're looking at the ability to deploy these tests, these what are known as neutralizing antibody tests, looking specifically for these type of antibodies that are generated from the vaccines, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, so they can quantify and measure the amount of antibodies present, because we all know that antibodies will wane over time. So we're looking at deploying this and be able to scale this on a large uh, population base so that a lot of people can be tested and prioritized if and when the boosters come to market. Hmm. Wow. And then is this something that you would do human trials on to test to see the efficacy of the results well, that you there get? There have been already. So this uh, assay that we're working with has already received FDA EUA, which is hmm. the use authorization. 
is the first one in the United States to be approved looking wow. for neutralizing antibodies. So right now we're in the process of validating this test. So there's a couple of ways, as you know, with most antibody tests or lab tests is based on blood or serum. We're looking at deploying a simple way of collecting a blood sample is through a finger stick. Mm -hmm. So just maybe three to five drops of blood that's collected that can be sent to the laboratory and then it can be tested to determine both whether or not you have antibodies resulting from your vaccine and the quantity, the amount of vaccine or antibodies yeah, mm. during a period of time. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at to be able to deploy this on a large scale for the population. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go to a laboratory, you know, to get, you know, blood drawn and so forth, because that's some resistance in the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And then would you initially start with Hawaii? And then yes, we are. So what we're looking at, if you recall back in January, the uh, the priority list of people that were vaccinated, you know, were the elderly people mm -hmm. living in congregate living facilities, the age mm -hmm. 75 and older, you know, people with the, you know, compromised health conditions. Mm -hmm. So we will be going back to that population and working with their care providers, you know, as to determine when and if they need to have a booster. Because we huh. anticipate the availability of booster shots may be at the Q4 at the end of this year. Oh, wow. So preparation, you know, looking to see, um, you know, which segment of the population would be suited for boosters. Not, you know, not a like general call, like everybody should going to get a booster mm. case. A lot of people, because they could be, you know, well protected for years, especially young and healthy. They mm. need a booster, but the ones that are at risk are the ones that, we are most concerned with to make sure that their antibodies, their titers are up to a level to protect them. Got it. And then these at-risk people, are they the ones, like, has it been shown that their antibodies decrease faster at a faster rate than other people? Yes. There's studies that have been done as people like transplant individuals, immunocompromised mm -hmm. individuals. They have done uh, studies already looking at the efficacy of the vaccines and mm -hmm. the baseline measurement. There's mm -hmm. a study on the Pfizer vaccine that was demonstrated that people that are over age 80, the amount of titers or the amount of concentration of antibodies was much lower than a person oh. of your age as well, too. So even, even just from the initial vaccine. Right. So even mm -hmm. though you've probably heard about like Pfizer or Moderna's 95, 94% efficacy rate, well, what happens mm -hmm. is 100,000, you know, that's like, you know, what, 5,000 people may not be effective, you know, with, or protected with the Wow. Vaccine. And so this is a way of measuring this. Mm -hmm. In the early days, you probably heard of lot of serology or antibody tests that were out in the market, but they were um, looking at, you know, what we call, you know, a uh, separate type of antibodies, not neutralizing antibodies, you know. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't specific to the vaccine because it wasn't developed or marketed at that time. So now mm. neutralizing antibodies tests are specific for the vaccine. Oh, was the previous test to detect more like if you had had COVID yeah, and if you still have antibodies? Yeah. So you, originally with the, um, the antibody test that first came out when the pandemic mm -hmm. broke and the controversy about that, it was that it was being used inappropriately, was looking huh. at, oh, you've been vaccinated, or not vaccinated, but you've been infected, mm -hmm. that they're looking for antibodies that are positive or negative. But from a population health perspective, you really want to look if the people have an active virus because they're the ones that are infecting other people. Mm -hmm. You want to catch it early. And then the question is about some of those uh, antibody tests that were out in the marketplace, they didn't seem to be very accurate or reliable. Mm -hmm. So they failed you know, considerably. So mm. they were not effective at the time. That's why there was a stop to allow those type of antibody tests because they were not very specific. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. now with a new way of you know measuring neutralizing antibodies based on the vaccine is a much if more effective strategy in managing and you know measuring the antibodies related to your vaccine. Wow. And how accurate are you guys able to get? So based on the assays and I guess the gold standard, they say it's hundred percent sensitivity and also 100% specificity. So there's a report that can be shared, so we're excited about that. 
So we compare it against a live virus is what was the standard against, but you can't do live virus because it's very dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, testing. But there are studies that's already been published and that's what could be releasing to the healthcare community, you know, for their review as well too. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. You know, once you know people understand this and be able to read the literature, the healthcare community, and be able to assess, you know, the uh, the efficacy of such a test in managing mm -hmm. the risk population. It's not something that be used for the general population. For all, we're not suggesting that, but for people that can mention immunocompromised, it might be ideally suited for them. You know, mm -hmm. to kind of measure the levels and when and should they have a booster, you know, shot at mm -hmm. some time. So like once it starts rolling out, like how would how would it um would it be every month they would get a test or more frequently? I think you know this would be on the guidance of their healthcare provider. So mm -hmm. like the ones that mentioned the high risk, the elderly and so forth, that we'd be going to those facilities and working with their uh, primary care doctor mm -hmm. and of administering this test. They may only need to have one test to take a, a measurement, and based on the results of that. It's up to the provider at that point to order another test if needed, or to say, well, you're going to need a booster. You know, when mm -hmm. it comes available, go ahead and get it. So it's not that you're going to need it, you know, every month, because mm -hmm. each one is different. You mm -hmm. know, the way, you know, how the antibodies affect our bodies and how long it lasts and so forth, it varies from person to person. Wow. So that's why this test is so important. Right. At least mm -hmm. it gives you a, uh, a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. their measurement there you may not need a booster right then you know mm -hmm. then in some future you want to test again in three months or some other time mm -hmm. that will provide you with you know a reference got it so are you guys planning to roll it out at the same time the booster is available so maybe no, like q4 yeah, yeah, this year uh, we're looking to uh, have this available uh in month of august oh in anticipation soon in advance of, you know, the announcement from the manufacturers of the availability of a booster and for the guidance from CDC about mm -hmm. the administration of the booster shot. So part of this is education, you know, to the healthcare community. So they have an understanding of what are neutralizing antibodies and how this test can uh, both based on qualitative and quantitative. You mm -hmm. know, so they understand and read the literature and see how they can use it most appropriately. Mm. Maybe could you give us a simple explanation about neutralizing antibodies? <laughs> yeah, well, neutralizing antibodies, basically, you know, when you get vaccinated, is you've probably seen that spike protein, you know, that, mm -hmm. that comes off. So mm -hmm. the neutralizing antibodies that were bind to that spike protein, and by binding around it, it will prevent it from the virus from, from transmitting through into your body, through the cells. Mm -hmm. So it's like a block. It, it, the, the, the antibodies is a block against the virus entering your body to your cells. So those are how the vaccine works. It's a basically an effective call neutralizing antibodies because it neutralizes the virus from entering the body. Mm. Got it. And are you guys working with the state or is this going to be private to, I guess, with the clinics and with the care homes? Would uh, that be something they would take on? Yeah. Yeah, it may be at some point depends on you know Department of Health, mm -hmm. you know, as to um, you know their position, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you, you know testing and so forth. To the part provide some guidance to the community at large as well too. Mm -hmm. But we're probably, mm -hmm. I'll be going to the care homes, you know, to the geriatricians, to the physician offices, and let them view the literature mm -hmm. and see if it's appropriate for their patients or not. Got it. Do you, I mean, if, if you don't mind my asking, do you have a price range? You don't have well, to answer. <laughs> no. Well, it's a good question right now because under the public health emergency, you know, serology or antibody testing is covered. Oh. So um, we anticipate because That's of the great. need for this of a medical necessity to kind of identify the adaptive immune system based on your vaccine that you mm -hmm that it deems to be a qualified medical necessity, especially for the elderly and so forth, and mm -hmm. that was covered. So as you know, with COVID testing during this whole pandemic, mm -hmm. it's been covered at no cost to the individual. And this will happen only during the public health emergency. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. we anticipate the public health emergency will be extended, you know, uh, perhaps for the rest of 2021, 
-hmm. if that's the case, the, the cost of the test should not be an issue for individuals, you know, seeking this. Mm -hmm. That's so great, especially, yeah. model, Basically, it's like COVID testing that we accept we have the reimbursement from Medicare or the insurance plans, and that will be it. And that's the arrangement that we have with the laboratory. Oh, that is good news. <laughs> yeah, because in the beginning, you don't want to make, you know, cost a barrier. Yeah, yeah. You know, about Especially that. rolling out a, a, new, a new test. Right, exactly. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. This is International Hawaii on ThinkTech, and my guest is Ernie Lee, and we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Mitch Ewan, host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy on ThinkTech Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy is about following the many clean energy initiatives in Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy appears weekly on ThinkTech Hawaii at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We'll see you then, aloha. Welcome back. This is International Hawaii. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki. And today we are talking with Ernie Lee of First Vitals Health and Wellness. And we're talking about their new programs to help Hawaii recover from this pandemic. Um, and we spoke about a new antibody test. And then you also have another project um, in partnership with Human API that's also related to the pandemic initially. And could you explain a little bit about this program and how it's going to help Hawaii? Sure. Uh, going back earlier, as I was mentioning about verifying, you know, CDC records or cards and so forth, mm -hmm. and people have been vaccinated at different facilities. Mm -hmm. So Human API is an organization uh, based on the word API is the application programming interface. It's an electronic means of extracting data, you know, from uh, medical records. So we connected with them to be able to access based on consent and permission from the consumer patient, mm -hmm. uh, the medical records to verify their CDC vaccination uh, information. So that was used and what we were doing part of the verification process is verify that record and then issue a digital health pass. So this digital mm -hmm. health pass you may heard about is controversial in certain markets, of course, you know, in a sense that be able to be used to uh, access public venues like concerts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. events, or even travel. They yeah. Of. So besides verifying your CDC record, your vaccination record, you also need to have a mechanism to be able to display that and not display all your personal health information, mm -hmm. the status of whether or not you have been vaccinated or not. So human API that we have worked with uh, be able to not only locally here in the state of Hawaii, but on the mainland as well. They're connected to the main, you know, pharmacy chains like CVS, Longs, Walgreens, mm. clubs, Walmart, and so forth. So right. that be able to verify these records and for us to be able to issue the, these digital health passes. But now with what we have just discussed earlier about the ability to provide, you know, neutralizing antibody testing, we're mm -hmm. also be able to add this as part of the feature of the digital health pass. So not only can it verify your vaccination record, but then also look at, you know, how long is that vaccination good for? Wow. You know, that's that. So that's the add-on. And our partnership with Human API helped us to at least reach out to the various data sources to verify vaccination records nationally. Then with that, mm -hmm. that's only a part of the uh, the use case that we're working with is so right now because it's COVID related, mm -hmm. you know, at specifically, you know, verifying records and then the status of, you know, antibody testing. But the bigger picture, the longer vision is the ability for an individual to own their own personal health record. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not aware of this, but in fact, of this year, the government mandated that individuals who want access to their medical records those healthcare providers must provide them access or copies of the records. 
So if you think about this, if you're an individual and you have a primary care physician and you have a number of specialists and you go to clinical labs, DLS, and you mm-hmm. go to the long, uh, longs for your pharmacy, mm-hmm. you, know, yeah. Yeah. you have medical records all over your place and then you're covered mm-hmm. by HMSA as an example, or UHA, and they have your claims data. Well, you're now able to have your own personal health record by making requests to each of these entities and bring all that data in into one longitudinal you know, personal health record. So hmm. that will be able to help you manage your uh, medical history and uh, also allows you to share that information, you know, with other, you know, healthcare providers, you know, based on your requirements. So this way you'll be able to have access to all your medical information at, you know, at mm-hmm. your fingers, basically. So this is a believe- project that we're working on, but that's a longer term project and try and pull all that together. But having this collaboration with uh, Human API as part of our partners that we're able to mm-hmm. work with them and design, you know, the personal health records for, you know, individuals. So were you guys helping verify for the, the you know, island travel where people could? Now, like- what happened there is that the uh, Safe Travels decided just to upload uh, the CDC card into the system. And then at their call, they can pull random checks. You know, oh, I see. So it wasn't like they're doing everybody. Right. So then, you know, it doesn't have an issue, you know, of uh, backup at the airports, things of that nature. Mm. You know? So you're able to upload and found that it wasn't a lot of, you know, fraud or, you know, forged documents or anything at this point, you know, but the thing is the ability to do an audit and look mm. at those records. And now the Department of Health, you know, has stood up their immunization registry. So they mm-hmm. will be another data source, you know, for safe travels to be able to verify. Because at the beginning of the year, there was, the, as you know, in the state of Hawaii, we didn't really have an immunization registry, you know, for its residents. Oh, I can. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad that that's where we're moving to. Yeah. And I can't believe that it's only been this year where you can actually get access to your health records. Like you would think that would be, seems intuitive that you would be able to access it anytime. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can access that, but the issue is this, you have to write it the old way was that you have to make a request in writing, you mm-hmm. have each one, and they will send it to you like, you know, um, paper copies or whatever. Like a hard copy. Right. Oh and so you do that. So the way today is based on interoperability, able to extract via a data extraction. So mm-hmm. then you format it into, let's say you have a personal health record and with it's different modules for like your medications, your immunization history, your lab test results, all that would be fed into the platform, your personal health record digitally. So you don't have to, you know, it's great to get all your records, but it's all on paper mm-hmm. versus this ability yeah. to have it electronically. Mm-hmm. And so that what happens with all these medical providers, they must be able to provide it to you electronically. Mm. So that's where you can see a lot of, uh, you know, third-party applications that are out there that is, you know, even like Apple, if I've seen their health kit, you know, uh, that they have, you know, on their platform that you can hold medical records as well too. So it's very similar to that, that you can have, you know, resources available to an individual and how you want to manage your records and which part of you trust and what you're going to use it for. Because you can limit in scope, you know, we go back to COVID and all you want to know is to have an immunization history. Because mm-hmm. I think like most people today didn't, you know, recall their last, you know, um, tetanus shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we just go get another one. So yeah. this would be able to manage this and then be able to keep it updated and take it with you. Yeah, and you can check it from anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can share it with you with any, you know, party or even for emergency use as well too. And then mm. you can see, you know, they emergency departments be able to access mm-hmm. different use cases, you know, and then also for like, um, if you have a, a care plan, you know, that have a number of different, you know, care providers that managing your chronic conditions, mm. be able to manage this effectively, you see your medication history, because you could share that under permission rights, mm-hmm. medication history, your lab test results, so you have consults with dietitians and those notes can be shared with others as well too. So oh, it's, I think there's a future, you know, whereby individuals, you know, kind of be in control of their health records and yeah. 
around and manage them effectively and seek the most appropriate care. And then also to be better transparency, because part of this uh, ability of you know, data exchange, you also got to know pricing. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because right now we're in a third-party payer system. A lot of times you get services, you don't really know the true cost of it <laughs> until you get you know, a bill. Wow. <laughs> and you can't figure out your know, you know, benefits and the payments that were rendered. So, oh, so that's all going to be in this. Yes. Interesting. So that's the future huh. where these personal health records can be getting and where the individual consumers will be in control. Mm -hmm. That's great, especially when you're getting medication and prescriptions from different specialists. And that's really important that, you know, oh, everybody absolutely. knows. But what the hard thing about medication is to have, you know, as you know, medication reconciliation, you mm -hmm. know, you could be prescribed by your primary care and specialists. You know, you have multiple specialists. You know, who's going to coordinate and reconcile yeah. this mess? They're not interacting with one another. And mm -hmm. it's the most current record of all your medication. Who has that? Mm -hmm. Well, it should be you, the yeah. individual taking it or not, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that's then if you control that, then you can share that information, you know, with your healthcare providers so they can see it much better. That's great. And so right now, your partnership with Human API is just for the vaccine verification and then when is this other part gonna oh that that's all part of our service model is all inclusive that we can do everything we just writing out the scripts as to what other data elements that we want to pull in since mm -hmm. you know, this really went to effect you know april 5th is when oh. this new law went to effect basically or mandate so mm -hmm. then we've been working on this but then with these covid initiatives you know we get you know pulled into that direction you know, as, mm -hmm. you know so now you know, just trying to prioritize, you yeah. know, what we're doing, you know, but at the, a lot of the challenge is that providers know that they need to release this information, but a lot of them are not ready to release the information oh, electronically yeah. as well, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, so it's going to take a while. Yeah, but they're all working towards that. They know what needs to be done. And the mm -hmm. different parts of the requirements are established by the mandate. So it's not like everything all at once, you know, pieces of it. And so, it's going to be like a um, uh, subscription service or? It's depending on the, on the provider. So it, the simple form, like in our business model, if you want to manage your records, we will go mm -hmm. up and get all these records for you. And it could be a subscription model, you mm -hmm. know, for updates and things of that nature. So it'd be fairly affordable because the reason why it's all electronic. So mm -hmm. once we have your connection, you know, to the labs or, you know, to CVS Longs as an example. And mm -hmm. there's a transaction, it gets updated automatically. So it'd be very cost efficient. So we don't need to do any manual processing once mm -hmm. it's been connected to what it does, these APIs. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very affordable. So it's not labor intensive. As the old days, they'd be asking for your medical record. <laughs> yeah, you know. You have to like you know, write it down for you. <laughs> yeah, get out, get, it, get all this paper, then we could do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would be so great. I mean, that sounds. So useful. Yeah. So. so watch for that. That's going to be, you know, forthcoming, you know, by end of this year, early next year, you can see a lot more of this. That's so exciting. Very good. And I can't believe you guys are right down the hallway. And I had no <laughs> idea you guys were doing all this. That's so great. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's great being at the trade zone here. We just love it. The people here are great. The facility is wonderful. The warehouse is ideal. And so we're really great. good here for all these years. Yeah, no, we're grateful to have you here. So we are going to leave it there. You've been watching International Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. We've been chatting with Ernie V of First Vitals. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and oh, your yeah. story. My pleasure, Cindy. <laughs> thank you so much. You and thank you so much to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Cindy Matsuki, and we'll be back with you in two weeks with another edition of International Hawaii. See you next time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.